Where I 
you have a hero? Did you have a hero? When you think of a hero, what do you think about? The Lord. Huh? The Lord. Okay. The Lord could be a hero, right? What, what do we normally think about for a hero? Heroes do what? They show up at just a time, right? They save us. Yeah. They save us. Uh, they do something heroic. Usually, um, usually we think about different kinds of heroes. Today we're going to talk about a hero that's kind of the silent hero. Um, and I think that he portrays an image like us. So whoever you are, wherever you are, in that level of Christianity or your Christ-filled living, could find yourself comparing yourself to a man like the one we're going to talk about. Normally we hear about him during Christmas. But even at Christmas time, we don't hear about him too much. Why do you think we don't hear about him too much? Because we don't know much about him. So there's not much to hear, but we hear enough. It's interesting that the individual we're going to talk about is a Bible character, and he never says anything. Doesn't say anything. It's amazing how sometimes the people that you learn the most from really don't say a lot. They're kind of quiet. Think about my heroes, my earthly heroes, my mentors, pretty quiet people. Pretty quiet giants that I can say about them. Today we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about a hero. I, I feel as a hero. Maybe you'll feel that way when we leave today. In every war there's always a hero, right? Usually we think about, you know, the winning side, the heroes. World War II, there was a lot of heroes. There was no shortage of heroes. Uh, heroes generally come from the winning side, but uh, most everyone agrees that one of the most unexpected heroes of all time was actually a Nazi. You say, what? Uh, but he was a lousy Nazi, <laughs> this hero. Uh, this isn't our Bible character. We're going to get to that in a minute. Uh, but this hero was a lousy Nazi. He was a womanizer. He was, uh, he was unfaithful to his wife over and over and over again. And he was a heavy drinker. He was a heavy drinker. Anybody know who that is? He was crooked. He was a crooked businessman. Scheming. Nobody trusted him. He was squarely. But he did something so heroic that a movie was made about him. What is it? You probably maybe heard the movie Center's List. This most un unlikely hero saved the lives of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Jews. And his name is still revered in Israel to this day. Isn't that amazing? Uh, there's a lot of different heroes. Um, this man was unlike an unlikely hero because of his character. This man. Uh, but there, there is another unlikely hero in the Bible who God made a hero because of his character. It was because of the kind of man that he was that God made him a hero. God uh, had him do something crazy amazing. And if you were asked to have done something so heroic, you might have turned it down. Sometimes God talks to us and he asks us to do things. We're like, you know... <laughs> I'm not going to touch that. Um, but this was a different case. This character's name was Joseph. We, we hear a lot of, of, about him fitting into certain uh, picture scenes during Christmas, but we're going to talk about it today. I think it's important to talk about because the title of our discussion is going to be uh, When God Guides You, God Provides. When God guides, God provides. Yeah. I want you to walk out the door with this. And I want you to say it to somebody. When God, when God guides, God provides. Don't forget it. That's what our, our title of our discussion is. And I think we learned that from Joseph in this story. Um, but it's interesting, Joseph never, never says anything in the Bible. 
We just know what was what God tells us about him. Uh, we have this unsung hero, and by all accounts, you you, should, you would say that Joseph was an unlikely one in the Bible. If you were to have named heroes in the Bible, you you would rarely have come up with that one. Joseph. Uh, think about this. Imagine God coming to you and saying, I'm going to send my son to become a human being who will be born of a virgin. And he will be fully human. I've already picked out the mother, so relax. I've already picked her out. But I'm going to let you pick out the father. Who would you choose? <coughs> what kind of person would you choose to raise Jesus? First of all, what would be important for you? God said, hey, I'm going to let you pick out the guy that's going to be the step in that, right? What kind of person would you would you think you'd have to choose? I mean, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. What would you look for? Somebody honest. Huh? Honest. Honest? You want someone honest? What else? Loving. Now remember, this is Jesus, right? This is God's son. So it's going to be a little more important, like, who you pick, right? You're going to want someone who's going to be able to do what? Teach him good things. For God's sake, give him good things, right? The Teach best provider, right? Never lack anything. Could be a king. Could be a leader. Could be someone with a lot of experience. Maybe it's an older man, right? <coughs> There's a lot of things that could come to your head about who you might set up as that hero. Um, you, you, you might be racing about some different things. Who would you choose? This is the man that's going to be given the responsibility of raising the Son of God. Uh, he's going to be the one that Jesus will call Dad. Right? Uh, he's the one that's going to be responsible for taking care of him, making sure his needs are met, making sure he makes it to manhood so he can accomplish the missions that he has in life. Who would you choose? Uh, you think maybe it's a king? King of kings. Maybe someone powerful. You'd want to choose a king, maybe. Uh, what better way to raise a king than yeah, a king raising a king, right? Maybe that's what you uh, Not available? Maybe you'd choose a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Somebody in power. Got a lot of stuff. Maybe that didn't exist back then, but I'm sure they had something similar like that back in that day. Uh, successful businessman. Uh, somebody with wealth and means to make sure the Son of God owns everything that he needs. He's going to own the, the universe at least, right? Everything you would ever need while he's here, he should have it. It would be someone who could afford to put him to the finest home, buy him the finest clothes, give him the best food, send him to the nicest schools. If you did, uh, uh, you, you would have not chosen the one God chose. Did you get that? Yeah. So if you were thinking that way, you would definitely not have chosen who God chose. Raising how we think as opposed to what is important to God. Because God chooses Joseph. Just a guy. Who is Joseph? He's a nobody. That's who he was. He was a nobody, a blue collar, minimum wage carpenter. He didn't go to school, didn't go to college, right? He didn't even finish high school. You couldn't have found a more ordinary person to raise Jesus. Joseph. That's him? What? And all we know about him is what God says about him. That's it. He never says a word in the Bible. You realize that? You read the Gospels. Joseph never says a word. He never says a word in the Bible. He's never on a stage. He's always in the back of the curtains. Quiet. He's in the background. We're talking about this man today because of one simple thing. Regardless of the cost, he was fully surrendered to the will of God. He loved God. He was simple. He was ordinary. Maybe you think he didn't have enough to offer. But what was the part of the character? Why did God choose him? 
This is why God chose Joseph. Because Joseph was fully surrendered for what? To do the will of God. And he knew it. Whatever God wanted, this was the kind of guy to do it. If God said, do this, even if he didn't want to, he'd do it. That's the kind of person he was. God knew it. He knew that was his character. When you look at the, the totality of his life, you discover what God does for all the Josephs in life. What does God do for all the Josephs? Now I want you to think about where you're at in your life, how you feel about your life, how you feel about the people in your life. I want you to ask yourself if you, you could be a Joseph. Right? In the world, what, what, what would that be like? It'd be like this. Yes, Lord. Do whatever God says to do. God says to do something. You feel like God's talking to you. You say, okay, I'll do it. I don't like it. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how it's going to work. But I'm going to do it. Right? That would be a Joseph. You'd probably like a Joseph if you're watching this or you're here. Let me be watching this later. Whatever God tells him to do. Never was that more true than... The last time you've seen Joseph mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, so before before we we really get uh, too excited about his last comment, I just want to read two verses with you. We're going to work into the last time we're told about Joseph, because you would think would you would you think Joseph would be mentioned all through the Bible? Like God would want you to know how he ended everything. But that's not what happens. And, and so it really tells you about the character about Joseph because Joseph didn't care. Joseph didn't need that. He didn't need to be up there. He could be in the back, but he, his character was he's going to do what God wanted. Uh, Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. All right. Matthew chapter 2, 13. Uh, and and through, we're going to read through 2, verse 15. We don't pray with him. If, dear God, we, we go into the... Scriptural text, we pray that your spirit will help us to get the most we can out of it. Pray that you help us to learn from this man how we can be a Joseph, how our character can be like Joseph, and how you can take care of us like Joseph. In the name of Jesus, we leave it in your care. Amen. Matthew chapter 2, beginning of verse 13. And when they were departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph. Now you remember the Joseph story, right? What happens? Well, God tells Mary she's going to have a baby and it's going to be God's. But Joseph is about ready to marry him. And in those days, that was a pretty bad thing, <laughs> right? She could be stoned. So he decides that he's going to distance himself from her, right? Scripture talk about that. And then God speaks to Joseph in a vision. Now, I still believe today that God speaks in dreams. And this is the case where God spoke uh, to this man, this simple guy who speaks to him in a dream. He has a dream. And God says, hey, take it easy. It, you know, this is, you're going to raise this child. And he ends up doing what God wants him to do. Just, he just does it, okay? Beginning in verse uh, 13 of chapter 2, And when they were departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. So at this point in the scripture, um, he's committed to this child, and, but now he has another dream. Now in this dream, he's being told to leave. Arise, to take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee words, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Now just, uh, well, when he arose, what did he do? The Bible says he did. He took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. Now I don't know how many of you have ever had a dream and got up the next day and left town. But that's what he did. He, he had a dream he got up the next day and he took his child who he's supposed to protect his gods and he took to the left town uh, departed into Egypt and there until the death of Herod he was remained there that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord through the prophet saying out of Egypt I have called my son so let's just stop there uh, in those verses there's a lot going on here, and I want you to think about uh, the, the title of the subject of our discussion. What's the subject of our discussion? Uh, God, God when God guides, God provides. God provides. Here we have a man who's kind of normal. In the sense that he's normal like us, right? He was asked to do something crazy, amazing, right? But he's a pretty normal guy. He's, 
He's, uh, you probably know a guy like that. I, I, I have a guy I think of in my head, and I think about what Joseph would be like. He's pretty normal, but he's an amazing guy. At this point in his life, though, he's told there's going to be some danger come to the baby. There's going to be some, he has a dream, there's going to be some danger. Now, what kind of stuff did Joseph have? Not a lot of stuff. What, what would it be like for you to get up tomorrow morning and take all your stuff and move? to a whole different city, a whole different group of people. You have no job. You, you just got married. You have a new family. You have a baby. And it's tough. It's great. How many of us could just take up and go? Right? You're like, hey, God, you know, that was a great dream, but I can't afford that right now. I don't, I don't even know what to ask for gas money right now to get over there to that town. Okay? So I want you to think about what position he's in. Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to go well for the, to our topic. Okay. Let me get back to this other topic. Uh, <laughs> well, we know what happens. He goes. He goes. Does whatever God wants. It's that character we're talking about. But stepping aside from this, this for just a second, this part of the story. Um, never was it more true his character and his love for God to do whatever God said, yes, Lord, than the last time we hear about him that anyone ever talks about. Him. Are you kind of curious what that was? You'd think that, you know, it'd be something like, something grand here, right? It's Joseph. Mary, you know, she's the mother of Jesus, right? Uh, the last time Joseph is mentioned in the New Testament, this is part of the story that a, a lot of us don't hear much about. But it's a it's it's a bookend to his magnificent life that he lived. We're going to learn all about all of us who follow Jesus wherever he wants in this story, wherever he wants to go. When you surrender to God, to God's call, you, you're called under God's care. Okay? So going back to the beginning of Joseph. And how he was introduced to us. Joseph is just like us. He's ordinary. He's simple. He wanted to be just a faithful, good, good guy, right? A tradesman, a worker. He wanted to be a learn something special, right? He wanted to meet a girl. That's what Joseph wanted. He wanted to get married. Um, he, he, was, he was a young man. Uh, he, he had some things he wanted to do in his life. He wanted to be faithful, though. Uh, he wanted to raise a family. He wanted to have kids. He wanted to live a quiet life. How many of you are like that? You'd be happy with just that, right? A good woman, great kids, a nice home, good job. Uh, he wanted these things, but something got in the way of the things he wanted. Now, I want you to think about all the things that you want and how you're going to be like Joseph. Okay? He wanted all these things that seemed pretty simple as he was going through his you know, routine of, of growing into a manhood. He's going to do the right thing, though, and he's going to take the blame with this girl, even though she's you know, pregnant. Um, and we talked a little bit about how he was quietly going to you know, put her away, right, privately, so she didn't get into trouble for being in this situation. Then a dream got in the way we talked about. God tells him not to be afraid. Take Mary. As your wife, go ahead and get married. Then the Roman government gets in the way. And they order a census to be taken. And now Joseph has to take care of a woman who is eight months pregnant. There's a census. They're looking for babies. It's going to be taken. And now Joseph has got this responsibility with a woman who's eight and a half months pregnant, and now they have to take this 70 mile trip to Egypt. 70 miles. It may not seem like a lot to you today, because you could jump in your car and you could be there in a very short amount of time, but maybe an hour. You'd be there in a the car, but you know, on a donkey with all the things you own, it might be a little different traveling that far. This was a hardship. Um, when they get there, there's no rooms there. He has to 
take Mary to a cave, so she gave birth in a cave. Think about this. They stay there for about two years, where Joseph probably has some family. That is where his family was from. So he was able to find work and provide. They probably just decided to make Bethlehem their home. There, when they arrived at Bethlehem. That's the first dream. That's the first dream. Okay? Now he has a second dream. Now they're, they've spent some time together. They're around family. They're doing fairly well. Uh, then another dream pops up. When they had gone, the Bible says, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream, and he said, get up and take the child and the mother and go to Egypt. That was the dream we just read. Stay there until I tell you that King Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That's what he gets in his dream. Now, we're not told of any words that Joseph spoke. Wouldn't you like to have them hear the whole conversation? I mean, did, did Joseph just wake up and maybe he looked at Mary and said, I just had a weird dream. But that's what I do, right? Yeah. I, I just had a weird dream. I don't know what it means. Right? We don't we don't hear about Joseph saying anything. Ah. But um I know what I would have said. Uh, and you know you put yourself in this situation. You gotta be kidding me. You're kidding me. Seriously? If, if this message is from God, do you know what that means for us? Right? You can't be serious. Another trip? Walking and leading a donkey with a mother and a baby through the desert to an unfamiliar place? Now, in the 21st century, if you had a dream like that, what would your reaction be today if you had a dream like that? What would your reaction be? You're like, crazy. I don't think so. Sorry. Uh, in the 21st century, that's the reaction a lot of us would have. Joseph would have probably said, we need to renegotiate our relationship, God, because I can't do this. And if you're God, why don't you just take care of the baby here? Why do I have to go? Why are you making me go? You're God. Why are you putting me through this? I bet you've probably said something like that before. Maybe you would have said that. There, there are two lessons we need to learn at this point in Joseph's life so far in our discussion that we need to learn. One is about following God. Following God. That's the first lesson. Following God. You can say whatever you want or how you react. But the first lesson is following God. And the other is about God that we follow. So the first lesson is what? You following God. The second lesson is the God we follow. And we're going to get into why that's important for you before we leave today. Following God isn't always easy. Flight, flight is not always smooth. It's not easy at all. And I'm going to tell you, if you thought that you were going to become a Christian, your life would be easy. It's not always easy. Sometimes it's hard. Yeah. Maybe you thought that life would be comfortable, velvet-lined highways to following Jesus. But I want to tell you, uh, if you want to live an easy, comfortable life, uh, whatever, you, you don't surrender to the Lord. Because it's not always going to be comfortable. God's not calling you for an easy work. Sometimes your plan, and here's why I say this. Sometimes your plans are going to be what? Sometimes your plans are going to be changed. Sometimes your plans are going to be changed. Look, uh, they're going to be disrupted in your life. Sometimes your hopes are going to be discarded. The things that you thought you'd be might be put aside. Your expectations, maybe you'll be a little disappointed. Jesus never baits and switches. He never promises and under delivers. Jesus never said it would be easy to follow Him. I want you to uh, take this out the door today. Let me tell you three things to remember, though. Okay? You're thinking about these things I'm saying. You're putting them in your head. One, it's going to cost you to serve Jesus. It's going to cost you. I can tell you. I can go. I can make a list for you and tell you the things it's costed me to come to church on Sundays. I can make a list for you. Now, I know that there are a lot of people who will say, I don't have to go to church because God doesn't expect me to go to church. You do whatever you want. But I can tell you that 
This commitment I made to God to come to church has costed me, and it's not easy. Don't make it easier for yourself by the choices you're making and putting those on God. God may want you to do a little bit more, and it could be that you're not willing to. I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, look, one, it's going to cost you to serve Jesus. It's not free. Two, it pays to serve Jesus. So yeah, you're, it's going to cost you, but you're also going to get some payment in, in, in the meantime. And I'm not talking about financial stuff. It always pays more than it costs. That's three. Did you get all three? Listen, uh, I'd like to tell you that just stay through your life and make it easy. Don't serve anything. Just go with the flow. But I'm going to tell you, if you decide to serve Christ, it's going to cost you. But it's going to pay you. And it's always going to pay you more than it costs. So in the end, you might have some disappointments, but guess what? That number three, that's the kicker, right? Uh, I can also make a list for how it has paid me more than it's cost. So once again, Joseph is being asked to pull up his stakes, what field belongings he has, pile, pile it all up, get on that donkey, ride, you know, miles to a place he's never been. He's never been there. He didn't go stake it out first for a couple of weeks, figure out if there was work or do some work study. He'd never been there. He had to go to people he doesn't know. Joseph may or may not have understood it at the time. He didn't know what he was going to do. And I, I just want to say there are going to be times in your life where you don't know what you're going to do. When the pile, bills are piled up. When pressures are too deep. When your relationships are falling apart. When children are going astray. There's going to be times where you're like, I, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't do it. And I feel like for Joseph, this was an ordinary guy. This isn't what he wanted. It was costing him. But looking back later, looking back later, I'm sure that Joseph realized what I want you to realize. And that is, you are under the providence of God. You are under a providence of God. God is in charge and God is running your show. He's running your show. You get so caught up not focusing on Jesus that you forget that God is in charge. When God guides, God provides. Yes. Forget it. It might look like in your mind, this ain't going to work. I can't do this anymore. Oh. I'm sure you could tell us stories about how you felt like that and then God came through for you. Can I get a witness on that? Right? That yeah. Yeah. Uh, where you felt like that was it and then all of a sudden something happens and guess what? It paid more than it costed you. Benjamin Franklin famously said this. This was a famous quote from Benjamin Franklin. I have lived and served a long time. And the longer I live, the more convinced, convincing proofs I see of the truth that God governs in the affairs of men. I feel like that. I feel like he's governing our show. God didn't choose Egypt simply by pulling a name out of a hat. He didn't just make this quick decision. You know what I'm going to do? Gonna, I think, you know what would really drive Joseph crazy? I'm going to send him. That's not what God did. God knew the plan made sense way before Joseph did. All right. He didn't flip a coin. He didn't close his eyes and point his finger at the map. <laughs> before Joseph was born, or Jesus was born, before they were all born, before any of us were born, God made a prediction and a prophecy found in Hosea. And it said, when Israel was a child, I loved him, but out of Egypt I called my son. It's part of the prophecy. God knew that this decision for him to go to Egypt made more sense because he knew what was going to happen. <laughs> How do we know this is what God was talking about? Because he who was writing this to the Jews himself pointed it out. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 15. And it was fulfilled that the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. So that we're seeing the prophecy fulfilled and then we're seeing 
the Bible writer of the New Testament confirming that was the promise. Do you know what the providence of God really means? Providence. 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 You, think, you think the first part of that, you think provide, right? God's going to provide. He's your provider. This is what it means. No matter what is going on in the world, in your life, no matter what in your own little world or private life is happening around you, everything is going according to what? God has a plan. You may walk out of this plan. God has one for you, right? You might. God opens the door and you're like, I don't want the door. God has a plan though. And His plan is, is the right one. He's got a plan for you. According to the plan, that's the deal. When we learn from Joseph, what we learn is this. When you surrender to God's call, you are under God's care, and you are guarded by the providence of God. What does that mean? Simply this. When God guides, God Provide. provides. Go back to the word providence for just a moment. There are two words you need to hear in that word. Pro and video, right? Pro, guidance. The word pro means before. The word video means to see. The providence of God involves God seeing it and providing for you. Knowing what's coming ahead of time. God knew what was going to happen if Joseph was going to stay in Bethlehem. He knew what was going to happen if, God was, if he stayed in Bethlehem. At the time, God speaks to Joseph in a dream. Now, I mentioned this earlier. I still believe that God talks to us in dreams. I believe that, uh, that He tells us things and He speaks to us, but I, I think you have to be careful sometimes about dreams. But I don't want you to shut dreams out when God is speaking to you. I want you to give great thought to what God may be saying to you in your dreams. Uh, this dream was real. It had a meaning, and the meaning was plain. Joseph was to take Mary, and uh, the most, uh, he was, let's see, he was to take Mary and Jesus to Egypt because Herod was going to do everything he could to find Jesus and do what? What did he want to do with Jesus? What did he want to do with him? Right? He wanted to kill him. That's what you're thinking, right? I know you knew that. He wanted to kill, kill Jesus. Why was that the case? Why do you think Herod wanted to kill Jesus? Before we, before we start closing up, why do you think Herod wanted to kill the baby? He's a baby, right? Because Herod was crazy. He was jealous. Right? He was jealous. Who, who else did Herod kill? Wives, right? Grandmas and grandpas, children. He was crazy. And why did he kill them? Because he was jealous, right? He felt like other people were going to take over his kingdom. So if that's how he felt, you were pretty much... If you, if you were a leader back in that day and you had people following you, you're probably going to end up killed by Herod, right? You have to understand he was crazy. He was a dictator. Herod, he was one of the most complex, weirdest people in history. Um, he was an Aaron. He married ten women and produced many children, but he was always worried that one of them was going to try to take over the throne someday. The historian Josephus tells us that Herod had several of his own family murdered. He had two of his sons strangled in a fort in Samaria. One of his wives, his favorite, was Miriam. And he began to doubt her loyalty, so he had to kill her, right? Uh, beyond that, he feared a Jewish uprising because the Jews hated him. He couldn't win their loyalty even though he began rebuilding the temple and built temples to pagan gods. Occasionally, he would have Jesus, Jews, crucified just for intimidating uh, the, his purposes, just for intimidation. He, that's how he was. He had the high priest and other priests killed. He enforced outrageous taxes on the Jewish people. He felt he was just one revolution away from losing the throne all the time. So it was this man that, uh, so it was to this man, some wise men show up to the east. Now we're getting back to Joseph. These wise men come in from the east. They come to Herod and ask him where they might find the king of the Jews. Hey, King Herod, can you tell us where the king of the Jews are? Is. How do you think King Herod reacted to that question? Huh? Ah. Uh, the problem was the Roman Senate had named Herod the king of the Jews. 
What? But that's not who the wise men were looking for. Uh, that was in 337 uh, BC. So immediately in Herod's mind, his number one goal became what? I've got to find out who this guy is, and i got to do what? Take him out. That's exactly what he did. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, the wise men, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill the boys to Jerusalem, uh, uh, Bethlehem, and its vicinity, who were two years old and under. Why? Because that would take care of this King Jesus, right? That's why he did it. That was his number one goal. So it immediately became, i got to find out who this is and take him out. And, uh, and that was all based on what? What he had learned from the, the, the magic. Now, don't get the idea that there were hundreds or thousands of little baby boys killed. Because there weren't, according to history. You might think there must have been millions of babies killed. But there weren't. There weren't even that many male children. The village only had maybe 20,000 people total, and probably not more than 20 children were killed, according to historians, even though, uh, even though one, of course, is too many. But, uh, so it, it, wasn't, it wasn't this huge mass killing that we hear what people think. It didn't matter to Herod, though, because all he wanted was one baby killed, right? It didn't matter. It wasn't going to stop until he killed him. That's all he wanted. Uh, he also killed his mother-in-law and his brother-in-law uh, and others. Death was nothing to him. What Herod didn't count on was God's beating him to the punch. Now, now can you see how God was thinking? Herod's not going to stop until he kills the baby. Right? The devil's going to do everything he can to help Herod to kill Jesus. He starts seeing how God is working behind the scenes. We didn't know that before. We didn't know before all this. Uh, so, when you are guarded by the providence of God, when you are guided by the providence of God, you are guided by the protection of God. So God tells Joseph to do what? Take his family to Egypt. 70 miles away, there you'd be saved. Take your family to Egypt. And it turns out it was the perfect place for him to go. Egypt was a Roman providence outside of Herod's jurisdiction. That's a perfect place. And it had a population of about a million people. <clears throat> Jews. Who would obviously welcome a Jew. Perfect place for him to go. They would have no trouble finding relatives or friends or finding a job. Now I want to give you another thing to think about. We're under the protection of God, but we also have the responsibility, uh, take the responsibility for our own protective actions necessary. So in other words, when God provides a way of escape, what are you going to do? When, when he provides a way that could be your escape, you, 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 you're going to take it, right? When he provides a way of escape, you take it. When God provides a place to hide, what do you do? You, you go hide, right? If God makes a place for you to hide, you go hide. Uh, right? Uh, when you know you shouldn't drink and drive, what do, we, what do we do? It's not a good idea, right? So what do we do? Well, we don't drink and drive, right? You can always know that if you are, you are guided by the providence of God, you are guarded by the protection of God. Okay? So if God gives you a place to hide, then you're, you're protected, you're provided by God. If, 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 God um, if God gives you an escape, then that's protection, right? Providence from God. Okay, we're getting, we're getting towards the end of this. Uh, bear with me. Without a question or hesitation, Joseph obeys God. You know, whatever, whatever it was in those dreams, he obeys and he does whatever God wants him to do. So he got up, he takes the child, he takes the mother. They, they, it's during the night. Imagine, I don't know, can you imagine being on a donkey and traveling through the desert here, 70 miles? Just imagine it. That's what he did. Uh, so he goes through the night, he leaves for Egypt, where he stayed until... King Herod's death. He did exactly what God wanted him to do. 
He made it. He made it. All that second guessing, how am I going to do it? He made it. Everything worked out. He was in Egypt. Probably had some good times there, right? So there's a question immediately has to be answered. Even though he was going to a place where there were Jews, he didn't know anybody. He didn't have any money to buy food. He didn't have a place to stay. He just left. Like, you know, back up your car, let's go. You might think of it, it's an adventure until you get there, right? And you have nowhere to go and nothing to eat and nowhere to stay and the weather turns bad, right? Maybe you have a flat tire, a flat donkey leg. I don't know. But we know he made it. But he didn't have everything he needed. <coughs> he had to have money to buy food, a place to stay for this trip. So how did he have the means to make the trip? Where did it come from? God tells us where it comes from. Isn't it interesting? We don't know. Joseph doesn't say anything. He would have had to put food on the table. He would have had to find a job and provide for his family. Where did he get it all? Go to the resource center? <laughs> God provided. Where God guides. God provides. God provides. Let me share something with you. And I haven't really thought about this much until I went over this information. I want to go back to the story that happened just before the dream. The wise men come from the east and they came to see and worship this newborn king. Remember the wise men? They come and they, they came to worship the Jesus, the king. Okay? Ah. Wise men from the east came to see and worship the newborn then we read a statement we've heard many times. Now, I know if you're watching this, you're going to be watching it. You already know this. You know this. Yeah. But maybe you didn't get it before. So I want, you to, I want you to go out the door knowing this and think about it like I did. The Bible says this, chapter 2, verse 11. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother... And they bow down and worship him. Can you see it in your mind? All right. Then they opened their treasures. The baby, right? The baby. They're worshiping the baby. They open up their gifts and they present them. And what were the gifts? The gifts were gold. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Frankincense and myrrh. Those were those were the gifts. So I want to ask you right now uh, to make this more, <clears throat> uh, to bring this home to your life. Have you ever been to a party with a child and people are opening gifts and somebody gives them a gift like, you know, like a gold bar or, you know, something that's out of place. They give a child a gift, a baby a gift, maybe it's a, a shower, right? And they're given gifts like, what in the world for a baby, right? I, I'm assuming there could have been a moment where maybe Mary or Joseph were thinking, what are you giving the baby frankincense for? You know what the frankincense for? And the gold was for? And the myrrh was for? For the future. Providence. Ah, look. The gifts those men carried were, were fit for a king. They were a gift you get to a, a king. Jesus was just a baby. Think about this. In today's prices, a pound of frankincense would have been about five hundred bucks. Now, five hundred dollars. Wow. A pound of myrrh would have been about four thousand dollars. Back in those days, you, you start to see what's happening here. When once you wondered how you were going to make it and what you were going to do, something happens and God's providence shows up because when God guides. God provides. Amen. Uh, a pound of myrrh, four thousand, right? A pound of gold at that time would have been about six hundred bucks. Joseph didn't have to worry about food, paying rent, finding shelter for his family, about getting there, how to get help. Joseph didn't have to worry about anything. God used some wise men from a foreign country that he had only met one time to take care of it all. 
How many times have things just happened to you and you're like, what? This person just helped me. I don't even know this person. Christina. What's murder? Murder is a, it's a, it's a, a, a perfume, right? I'm thinking oil. Of perfume. oil. Perfume? Yeah. Oh. God used these wise men from a foreign country to help. When God guides, God provides. God provides. Where God leads, He meets your needs. Wow. Uh, he always pays for what He orders. When God orders, when He puts the order out, you don't have to worry. If God puts you to work, don't worry. It's going to work out. I'm not telling you to be lazy. Because God expects you to work. But if God asks you to do something, let me tell you, God will take care of you. I have, I have learned it and seen it. Where, where, where God guides, if He's guiding you and, you're, and, you're, and God says, I want you to do this, God's going to provide for you. Ah. Okay. I want to remind all of us today Everyone, everything you work for, everything you think you know or you've earned, I want to remind you that everything you've accumulated, God owns everything. He can take it all away from you. He can give it to you. He can take it from you. It's God's. You are what you are by the grace of God. You have what you have by the grace of God and you have what you have by Him. That is why you and I really own nothing. So don't think too, too much of yourself. Now, the last time Joseph is mentioned, uh, and I, I feel like maybe you're waiting for this point, because I built it up. Uh, Joseph's character. I want you to be a Joseph if you're watching this. You've got to watch this later you're here. I want you to think about Joseph. Who did what God wanted to do. The last time Joseph is mentioned is his being alive is in the Gospel of Luke. The last time. The whole time. Joseph never says a word. Ah. Jesus at this point was 12 years old. Joseph had been his, his dad, right? Since he was a baby, protected him, did what God wanted him to do. Taught him how to be what? A carpenter, remember? That was a skill that Jesus took on, just like Joseph. They had to work together and learn from each other, right? Probably had a special relation with Jesus we can't even understand. Uh, Jesus says at this point, he's 12 years old, the last time we hear about Joseph. Mary and Joseph take Jesus to the Passover festival. It's a normal festival. They're going to go pay their dues right at the festival, show up and do their worship. When they left to go home, they assumed that Jesus was with them or with someone else until they discovered uh, he wasn't. He, and they couldn't find Jesus. They thought maybe he was with someone else, but they found out that where was he? You remember where Jesus was? He was lost, right? Well, Jesus wasn't lost, but they thought he was lost. You remember where he was? He was at the temple, right? He was at the temple with the rabbis and the teachers and Jesus, right? God's son. He's 12 years old, but he wanders in there into the temple and he starts teaching the creatures, right? That's what happened. What happened here? They were asking him questions. They were asking him brilliant questions. And, and Jesus was talking to them. And they were amazed at Jesus because of the things he was saying. Uh, I want to just read to you this from the Bible because I think this is powerful. Chapter 2 of Luke. Did I say Matthew? Yeah. I'm so sorry. It's actually Matthew. I knew that. Matthew chapter 2. Okay. Matthew chapter 2, verse 48. This is it. And when they saw him, when they saw him, you ever lose a child? 
You ever lose a child when they're little? I remember losing a child and <clears throat> freaking out, right? You freak out and where'd they go? Uh, and when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Why, why'd you do this, right? Why'd you do this to us? Behold thy father, and I have sought thee sorrowing. Behold who? What did she say? Father. Look at your dad. Look at your father. We've been looking for you. And she's emotional, right? You'd be like that if you were there. And this is what Jesus says. How is it that you sought me? Knew ye not that I must, I must be at my father's business? Some translations say, I must be at my father's house. It's the last time you hear about Joseph. How does that make you feel? God said everything he needed to say about Joseph. Ah... Uh, Do you think Joseph felt like his dad? Sure. Right? But he never argued with Jesus when Jesus said, didn't you know I'd be at my father's house? Right? <clears throat> when he referred to God as his father, I don't know. I don't think he was jealous or upset. I don't. I don't think he was. Huh? I think he probably smiled because Jesus knew, as did Joseph, who his real father was. He probably smiled. Joseph probably smiled. Yeah, you got me. You know, right? Uh, isn't that the way it is to be an unsung hero? See why I call him an unsung hero? You're watching this later. Maybe you felt like Joseph. To be willing to stand off in a shadow, behind the scenes, out of the limelight, but give what? All the time. Thanks. Glory to God. That's what Joseph was like. One man I'm excited to meet is the man that taught me a lesson while reading the Bible. And he didn't say a word. But he taught me that when God, Does. when God guides, God provides. God provides. That's what he taught me. And I'm excited to go to heaven so that I can see what his voice sounds like and see what he'd say. Because he didn't say that to me. One of the greatest men in the history of this world. The unsung hero, a hero of heroes, who is in God's Hall of Fame. Because why? Because he stayed faithful. He stepped up. He stood strong. That's what I want to encourage you. And not to give up. When you walk out the store, I want you to be confident that if God is guiding you, God will provide for you. Amen.
sometimes we don't pray to God enough, but I want, I want you to use this next couple minutes to where I want you to, I want you to start off when, I, when, when I, I'm, I'm going to thank God for being here. I want you to tell God what you want to tell God. Take a couple minutes and just get personal. Did you do that for me? You can start off by telling God, thank you for getting me here in the afternoon today. Thank you for this day of worship. Right? So let's just bow our heads. I don't know what it is you want to tell God, but I know there's, there's something going on with everybody. Feel sometimes we don't talk to God enough, but if we just give him, just tell God what you want to tell him. Tell him, thank you, God. God, thank you. God, as a church, we come before you and we leave our lives in your hands. We ask you that we would treat sins. Tell us so much of our problems. We ask that your Holy Spirit to reach out and touch her, that you empower her. And that you provide for her, you give her a way to escape. She goes and sees the doctor. We know God that she's going to come give us a testimony that she was free. That you're going to touch her body and heal her. And when we see her again, she won't have that impression from her. So tell us a testimony about how, under your guidance, you provide her. God, we pray that you continue to bless her efforts. She's here. She's faithful to you. She's just like Joseph. Oh. In the name of Jesus, we ask this to be for you. Whatever it is that you want to talk to God, I just want you to take just a few minutes just to talk to him. Church this afternoon as we close, just say what you want to say to God. 